there's a high-flying eccentric with a troubling secret in Mr. Jones. Generals Tom Berenger and Martin Sheen lead the Confederate attack at Gettysburg. And a pint-sized kid will do anything to play Notre Dame football in Rudy. get in next semester, it's over, done. Notre Dame doesn't accept senior transfers. A young working class man, yeah. small of stature but long on guts, of dreams job. of playing Notre Dame football in a true good. story called Rudy, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with Richard Gere and Jack Lemmon's latest pictures, as well as epic films about the Civil War and China. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is in the great tradition of the sports underdog picture, and although it doesn't lack its fair share of scenes that we've seen many times before, somehow they all work together to create an enormously entertaining picture. The name of the movie is Rudy, and it tells the true story of a kid named Rudy Rudiger who grows up in Joliet, Illinois, as a dedicated Notre Dame fan. His grades aren't too good, and he's way too small for big-time college football, but he decides to go to South Bend in the face of his father's opposition. Notre Dame is for rich kids, smart kids, great athletes. It's not for us. That's Ned Beatty as the father, and there's another good supporting performance by Robert Prosky as the priest who sympathizes with Rudy's dream. Holy Cross Junior College is nearby. I can get you one semester there. You make grades, you get another semester. Then maybe with a high enough GPA, you might have a chance of getting into Notre Dame. Rudy eventually gets into Notre Dame and tries out for the team. My job is to basically beat the out of you for the next five days. And whoever is still standing at the end, maybe we'll use for our scout teams. A groundskeeper, well played by Charles S. Dutton, gives Rudy a pep talk when Rudy's belief in himself wavers. You're five feet nothing, a hundred and nothing, and you got hardly a speck of athletic ability. And you hung in with the best college football team in the land for two years. And you're also going to walk out of here with a degree from the University of Notre Dame. In this lifetime, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody except yourself. And that's Sean Astin there, very convincing in the title role. This story is told against the background of a working class kid with no money who sleeps in the janitor's room because he can't afford rent and who studies twice as hard to make up for his academic difficulties. The movie ends with the information that the real Rudy was carried off the field on the team's shoulders in 1975 an honor that has not been given to anyone since. And I'm going, yeah, that's great. Well, it is a terrific film. And, you know, it starts out, I think they have a line, this is based on a true story. And that always puts me on edge, you yeah. know, because I'll decide whether it's good or not, whether it's true or not. Uh -huh. But it does work. And I think there are two good reasons. One, I think Sean Astin is really wonderful in this role. He's playing a good person, but he doesn't make him sweet and cloying. Mm -hmm. He's just earnest there. And it's a quiet performance. He's confident that the camera will photogra photograph him trying to go do good deeds and that mm -hmm. his character will come out that way and then one other thing rather than just be about football to get it to notre dame he has to get into another school first to qualify to get into notre dame mm -hmm. so the movie is about academic uh testing and straining to do well academically so it's not just all football so it embraces the whole character of a person I think it's terrific. You I know, really enjoyed it. This movie was directed by the same man who made Hoosiers, which is right. another movie that we loved. It was about an underdog Indiana basketball team. Now we have uh, an underdog on a top dog Indiana football yeah. team. The director's name was David Anspach. Now, I was in a minority on Hoosiers, but this film I really like. I think it's even better. Okay, our next film is a picture with a fine pedigree. It's called A Life in the Theater, an early play by David Mamet. Now on film for TNT television starting this weekend. It stars Jack Lemmon and Matthew Broderick. And what it's very good at is communicating how for theater actors, acting is probably the most important thing they do in their lives. For Jack Lemmon, it's the only important thing. These moments make it all. Just make it all worthwhile. 
Yeah. With Matthew Broderick, his young partner in a repertory company, Jack Lemmon plays the old veteran actor to the hilt. Have I told you this lately? You are becoming a very fine young actor. See, the flaws of the youth are, are, are the prerequisite of the young. It is the prerequisite of the young to possess the flaws of youth. It's fitting, yes. Don't mock me. Less entertaining are the onstage bits with all sorts of screw-ups. Would you like a glass of tea? Oh, thank you, yes. I like this room. Yes, so do I. I always have. Oh, I'll ring for tea. Thank you. Life in the Theater is a high-gloss made-for-TV movie that, as I mentioned, does start playing this weekend on TNT Cable. I'm giving it, however, only a mixed review because it doesn't have enough of the moments I wanted. But the backstage material that is there is quite emotional and well-acted. However, you know, I would really like to see Jack Lemmon stop playing down-at-the-heels characters and instead play someone very sharp and contemporary. I think that would be refreshing for him now well, in his it career. Would, it would be a nice change, although he's very good here. And also Matthew Broderick, uh, who I think is a very underrated actor, does yeah. a terrific job here of playing against the older actor's the theatricality. Old, yeah. And so you, you realize that Broderick is the, is the position in the movie where the energy eventually arrives at. But, you know, I disagree with you that the, 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 the screw-ups aren't funny. Well. Because when I first saw this, this play on the stage, it occurred to me that what, what Mamet is doing here is talking about the two kinds of theatrical reality. Actors are always talking about disasters. Every time they get together, they tell stories about what went wrong and how they forgot their lines and somebody got on stage without a prop or the lights fell or the mm -hmm. scenery fell over or something terrible happened or somebody was drunk. And all of this stuff they laugh about, but what they don't laugh about is the real stuff. Right. And so what he's trying to do, I think in a way, everything in this movie is backstage. Well, uh, you know, here's what I think, Roger. I would have liked to have seen some serious moments on mm -hmm. stage rather than just f funny moments on stage. I thought that would have made it very touching. And then, even, just much more on the backstage stuff. That's the stuff I like. A mixed well, review for me. It's an interesting, I give it a thumbs up. Okay. When we come back, Richard Gere plays a mentally ill man who wins the heart of his psychiatrist in Mr. Jones. Wonderful afternoon, wasn't it? Richard Gere is in the high-flying manic phase there of a manic depressive disorder. Filled with euphoria, he thinks he can't fail at anything, even walking on stage during a symphony concert to take over conducting the orchestra. But after the highs come the lows, and Mr. Jones is the story of how this attractive and charismatic mystery man encounters a psychiatrist played by Lena Olin who falls under his spell. Who are flying dreams? I don't know. Maybe when I was a kid. Ah. You know, interesting. I've asked that question all over the world, and everyone says the same thing. So, why is it only children have flying dreams? She likes him, but she knows he's sick, and to help him, she has to try to commit him to her mental hospital. At the hearing, he turns in a charming performance on his own behalf. I swear, I swear on my life, I could have done a better job conducting that Beethoven piece. I mean it. Please, please, Your Honor, please, Your Honor, please do not lock me up. You don't have to do this. I promise I'll be a good boy. The film shows Mr. Jones as he goes in and out of balance, as in this scene where once again he is dangerously euphoric. There is a lot of good material in Mr. Jones, including Richard Gere's performance as a man who seems able to turn on the charm even when it's really only his illness that's talking. But plugging this character into a love story with his psychiatrist was a bad Hollywood-style idea, I think, even though she is shown as fully aware of the realities and dangers of such a course. It displaces the movie's tension. We want them to fall in love instead of for him to get well, and so in a way, the story is working against itself. It shouldn't turn into a love story. Okay, I, I agree with you, and I'm recommending it marginally on just that basis, because you're right, the story of the psychiatrist, I was so rooting against that twist being taken, yeah. because it does seem like another showbiz story, and in reality, a good psychiatrist isn't gonna get anywhere near that sort of thing, and it would have been much more interesting to have her handle him on a professional basis with 
some emotion. Let, let, him, let, her, let him fall in love with her okay. if he wants to, but she okay. has to then deal with that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the reason I'm recommending it is because of two things. One, I, wanted, I saw a promo for this film, a coming attractions trailer, and it made it seem like this was a f comedy. I don't know if you saw the same thing. Oh, where he's a happy yes. guy and uh, everything I, is terrific. I yeah. was expecting a comedy called Mr. Jones about this wacky guy who'll yes. do and say anything. <laughs> and suddenly I'm watching this picture. I said, this is a serious film. This is Richard Gere taking a lot of risk. He's one of the most risk-taking actors that we yes, have. He yes. And he deserves a lot of credit for it. These are scenes that could be very embarrassing. A character like this does embarrass himself. I thought that was fascinating. It would have been a really good film if they'd stayed away yeah, from the love yeah. story. So well, marginally I, thumbs up for me. And the same for me, and once again because of Richard Gere. And the way that he goes in and out of these uh, stages very well is done. probably a lot better than, than some people will recognize because they won't realize how difficult it is for an actor to And they're to not going to figure out, we've sort of told people roughly what the story is, but I sat there, it was unfolding, I didn't know what was going on. It was fun. Coming up next, a four-hour Civil War epic called Gettysburg about the epic battle that killed more than 43,000 Americans. That's a scene from Gettysburg, a most ambitious four-hour Civil War epic about the critical three-day battle in 1863 that cost more than 40,000 American lives. Atlanta's Ted Turner financed this project, which may explain why the second half of the film is skewed toward a more gallant portrayal of the Confederate Army than the Union soldiers. That's what turned this Yankee off from the film, at least toward the end, which does have one marvelous performance. And that belongs to Jeff Daniels as Union Colonel Joshua Lawrence Many Chamberlain, who speaks to 120 renegade soldiers here from Maine who have been sent to his regiment after refusing to continue fighting. His performance is utterly natural and unconventional. I wanted the whole movie to be about him. This is a different kind of army. If you look back through history, you will see men fighting for pay, for women, for some other kind of loot. They fight for land, power, because a king leads them or, or just because they like killing. But we are here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. As for the Confederate side, their story is told mostly in the second half of the four-hour film, after intermission, as Martin Sheen, playing General Robert E. Lee, calls for continued attacks by his General Longstreet, Tom Berenger, even when the tide of battle is against them. If we retreat now, we will have fought here for two days and will leave knowing we could not drive him off. And I have never yet left the enemy in command of the field, no, sir. Retreat is no longer an option. A poignant moment is supplied by General Armistad, portrayed by the late actor Richard Jordan, who died after making this film. Here, mortally wounded at Pickett's charge, he sends a message to his best friend, a Union general. Will you tell him how oh. very sorry I am? At the end of the picture, I felt that there was a need somehow for this film to congratulate the Confederate soldiers on their bravery, more than acknowledge what the Union soldiers had accomplished, which was to save the Union. I'm sure that was going to play well down south, but it seemed like a cop-out to me. Therefore, surprising to me, a mixed review on Gettysburg. Gene, I totally disagree with you in your criticism of the balance of this picture. Okay. This is a movie about Gettysburg. Right. It's not a movie about the Civil War or about the reasons for the Civil War. That's made very clear. Well, they also, they and do have speeches uh, about the reasons for the Civil War. In and fact, in fact the, the Chamberlain has a speech that he delivered. It's delivered. more centered on strategy and tactics, military yeah. planning, than anything else. There's By the of end of this movie, which they shot on location on the actual battlefield using yeah. a lot of Civil War of buffs dressed up in the correct uniform. And so yeah, you really understand how that battle took place. And the battle that you're talking about, which Lee uh, bears responsibility for and right. is blamed for in the yeah. movie, yes. is suicidal. And it actually turns the tide of battle. So they had enormous courage, uh, the Confederates did, certainly in walking into almost certain death because of what they believed Roger. in. Uh, right. But at the same time, the movie isn't about that. The movie is about, it seems to me, Lee's own almost mystical faith in his truth. Well, what I, I certainly am not suggesting that the Confederate soldiers weren't brave. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, indeed, the leadership was foolish in the case yes, of Lee. Yes, and that's really what the okay. movie is about. Uh, 
the fact that the, it is authentic, uh, Glory, a much better film as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. was uh, uh, equally authentic, or maybe even more so. Glory got tremendous reviews from, uh, there are so many Civil War buffs around. I thought that the Glory story played real, and this thing went on and on and on. Well, I just I felt will, it was really obvious. I will grant you that the battle scenes are almost oh the whole Lord. movie. And I, what the, I, yeah. this is a movie the Civil War buffs are going to yes, love. Yes, they are. And that other people are probably not going to love. And I'm one of the other people. Much. Okay, fine. When we come back, Farewell My Concubine, an epic from China told against the background of the sexual intrigue of the Peking Opera. A new Chinese movie named Farewell My Concubine is one of the most lavishly produced and historically fascinating films out of Asia in many years telling the story of six decades of upheaval in China against a backdrop of the ancient Peking opera. The story involves two members of the opera troupe, a character named Duan Zhou Lo, who plays the king in traditional productions, and Cheng Dai, a transvestite, playing his concubine. The transvestite is in love with his partner and is angered when he learns his longtime friend is going to get married. Hey, the outside world sometimes seems distant from the Peking Opera stage, but not after the Japanese invade China. Zhou Lo is offended that Dei Yi has entertained a Japanese audience. The most harrowing scenes in the movie take place during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, when political and ideological correctness is enforced sometimes on pain of death by gangs of fanatic young people. The only question I had during Farewell My Concubine was how those characters managed to age so well over a period of some 40 years. They don't look that old at the end of the movie. Apart from that, I found this movie absorbing in all sorts of ways for its cultural, romantic, political, and artistic content. The opening scenes show young boys being drilled for the opera in methods so painful and strict that even Charles Dickens in Victorian London would have been shocked. Then there's the lifelong relationship between the two acting partners and the King character's wife, who helps them survive some of the worst times. And through their eyes, we see decades of tumultuous Chinese history. This is a fascinating film. It absolutely is. As a history lesson, it's a great way to study the last 60 years of China. And what, it proves something that I know, and I know you know as a reporter. And that is, if you want to learn about history, you can find it in the most odd places. That the patterns in the world will, f will force themselves into other corners of the world, like opera. Mm -hmm. Just study the opera in China in 60 years. You could have studied business in China in 60 years. You would have found the same thing. But by narrow casting, their focus here on the Chinese opera characters, the whole world opens up. And, and, and looking at it small, you can get more detailed. The performances are great. The staging is great. The whole notion of these kids being whipped into shape shows a mentality that will allow themselves to be dominated. Because, you know, Americans are sitting going to sit and watch this film. Why are these, these changes able to happen you so know, quickly it's funny because country? there's a, even a symmetry there. Because at the beginning of the movie, the old people are taking these little children and, and really, Cutting literally the whip, them. whipping them to make yeah. them into opera singers. Right. By the end of the movie, it's the young people who are pounding the old people with their cultural revolution. And so it's gone full circle. It is a great film. Coming up next, our video pick of the week. It's a new film just out on video. You may have heard of this one before. By Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. Our video pick of the week is getting a lot of attention. It's quite likely that before the year is out, Aladdin, just released on home video, may become the best-selling film on tape. And that's a tribute, I think, as much to its marketing as to the film, which is only spectacular when Robin Williams is on the screen as the genie. Here he comes. And what better way to make your grand entrance on the streets of Agrabah than riding your very own brand new camel? Watch out, they spit. You definitely will get your money's worth from repeated viewing by your kids. But Beauty and the Beast, it's not. Aladdin, our video pick of the week. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Rudy the surprisingly enjoyable tale of a college football player with a lot of guts. You know where this film is going, but it still works getting you there. A marvelous performance by Sean Astin in the title role. A split vote on life in the theater with Jack Lemmon and Matthew Broderick. Roger enjoyed the onstage material more than I did. It's on TNT television starting this weekend. Two marginal thumbs up for Mr. Jones, a strange love story about a manic depressive man and his psychiatrist. 
Richard Gere's risk-taking performance triumphs over a corny love story. A split vote on Gettysburg. Roger forgave at Southern Slant more than I did. We both admired tremendously Jeff Daniels' performance. He deserves a supporting actor Oscar nomination. He's that good. Finally, two thumbs up for Farewell, My Concubine, the epic story of the twists and turns and upheavals in modern China as told through the lives of a couple of famous Peking opera stars. Rudy is the big surprise to Rudy, me. Rudy, and if people can see Farewell, My Concubine. Yes. yes. That's and... going to move slowly around the country. Worth checking out. Okay, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Fearless, starring Jeff Bridges and Rosie Perez as survivors of a fiery plane crash, and The Beverly Hillbilly, starring Jim Varney as the head of the Arkansas Clampets and Lily Tomlin as his would-be financial advisor. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. St. Ives Swiss Formula Collagen Elastin Lotion. Made to work in the harsh Swiss Alps, St. Ives Swiss Formula relieves dry skin instantly, naturally. Vicks Vapor Inhaler. For fast, effective relief of nasal congestion, easy to carry and easy to use anytime, anywhere. Take a breather with the Vicks Vapor Inhaler. Fashion Bug. For the latest in junior, misses, plus even girls and men's fashions, 1,200 stores coast to coast, Fashion Bug fits your life. Easy Spirit Casuals. If we can make a pump as comfortable as a sneaker, imagine what we can do for casual shoes.